The Things We Make, by Bill Hammack unravels the misconceptions surrounding remarkable and ordinary inventions alike, shedding light on the creative application of the engineering method. This principle elucidates the ancient techniques employed by civilizations such as the Greeks, Romans, Chinese, Incas, and Egyptians, which continue to captivate our imagination to this day. Surprisingly, the masterminds behind these grand endeavors often possessed limited literacy skills and lacked the extensive scientific resources accessible at the touch of a button today. Nevertheless, by embracing the engineering method, they achieved awe-inspiring feats of craftsmanship that have stood the test of time. The book not only explores the historical wonders but also emphasizes the possibility of applying these principles to our own lives. Delving into the essence of the engineering method, readers will discover its definition and learn how to implement it. From the construction of majestic cathedrals to the design of a simple soda can, even to the pivotal role it played in world wars, the engineering method has demonstrated its versatility and significance. Through insightful examples, readers will come to appreciate its profound correlation with various scientific disciplines, unveiling its potential to solve some of the most pressing challenges of our existence. By adopting the perspective of the engineering method, the world transforms from a collection of objects and processes into a realm of creative beauty and engineering marvels. The Things We Make offers a profound exploration of this transformative lens, providing readers with a fresh appreciation for the remarkable achievements of the past and inspiring new perspectives on the potential for innovation in their own lives. Chapter 1. Unveiling the Masterful Techniques, the Ingenious Engineering Methods of Master Masons. In the era of 13th century Europe, the arrival of a master mason at a construction site commanded immense respect. While their mathematical prowess may pale in comparison to today's engineers and architects, their unparalleled skill and visionary craftsmanship were undeniable. This fact is exemplified in the awe-inspiring structures they left behind, such as the Saint-Chapelle in France, Girona Cathedral, and numerous other architectural marvels scattered across Europe. To construct soaring cathedrals that offered spacious interiors, Christian architects drew inspiration from the pointed arch model introduced by Muslims, who in turn had learned it from Indian Buddhist temples. Though the concept itself was easy to replicate, avoiding the collapse of massive cathedral walls required cunning ingenuity. Thin walls would be precarious, yet thick walls would encroach upon valuable space and land. So, how did they achieve the seemingly impossible task of constructing solid, expansive cathedrals while ensuring safety? They returned to an ancient yet brilliant technique, they employed a simple rope. Draping the rope over the arch, they folded it into three equal parts and utilized the markings on the rope to divide the arch into thirds, physically marking every third point on the cathedral. Then, by measuring the distance from a marked spot to the wall of the arch and extending it by the same measure, they obtained the precise thickness necessary to support that specific arch. This dependable rule of thumb granted the architects the knowledge to determine the optimal wall thickness as they proceeded with construction. While erecting the walls, they diligently watched for cracks, reinforcing any they discovered with sturdier stone. Masons fortunate enough to possess high-quality stone would subtract three inches from their already sturdy walls, while those with less favorable materials would add three inches for added strength. Driven by limited resources, constrained time, uncertainty, and a lack of precise knowledge regarding their materials, the master masons of Europe ingeniously applied age-old rules of thumb in creative ways. This approach, known as the engineering method, lies at the heart of all remarkable achievements. Drawing from their apprenticeship training, accumulated experiential knowledge, and intuitive decision-making, they embraced the possibility of making mistakes along the way prioritizing the invaluable opportunity for learning and growth. Analogous to covering the center of a chessboard, their strategies aim to increase the odds of success, acknowledging that victory may not always be guaranteed. Across diverse fields and cultures, the reliance on practical rules of thumb, born out of sheer pragmatism, serves as a foundation upon which engineers continue to propel humanity forward. However, before embarking on any leap of progress, it is imperative to first define the ultimate goal, as only then can the journey towards innovation truly commence. Chapter 2. Pushing Boundaries, Engineering for Inclusivity and Optimal Solutions 
In the pursuit of creating ordinary tools and tasks that offer the greatest value, engineers face the challenge of determining what truly constitutes the ideal solution. Enter Henry Dreyfus, the renowned industrial designer of the 20th century, whose innovative vision transformed homes and offices with practical appliances ranging from clocks to telephones, thermostats to pens. In the 1930s, Dreyfus confronted the task of designing for diverse body types. Seeking guidance, he compiled data from the U.S. Army on the physical characteristics of ordinary men and women at the time. Armed with this knowledge, he crafted products tailored to the average person, which proved to be a stroke of genius. While his designs did not cater to every individual, they fit the majority. Take, for instance, his Model 302 desk telephone, designed with the average distance between the mouth and ear in mind. Similarly, his Honeywell thermostat, based on these measurements, became the industry standard. However, it is essential to recognize that engineers do not work in isolation but are influenced by their cultural context, leading to inherent biases in their inventions. While Dreyfus's American standards accurately represented the majority of Americans at the time, they might not have been the most suitable standard for other cultures with differing physical characteristics or available resources. Circumstances, resources, and knowledge vary across regions, resulting in distinct engineering solutions. Consider factors such as race, age, gender, and numerous others. For instance, crash test dummies modeled predominantly on males fail to account for the safety of women and children. Similarly, designing a game controller for ambidextrous use or favoring ramps over staircases acknowledges the needs of individuals with disabilities. Engineering decisions tailored to accommodate men's preferences in office temperatures, for example, can result in discomfort for women, whose lower metabolic rate makes them more susceptible to the cold. Likewise, internet algorithms often cater to the input preferences of their creators, while voice recognition software struggles with foreign accents. The very notion of best also challenges our understanding of equality. Allocating an equal number of toilets to men and women in an office may seem fair, yet women spend double the time in restrooms compared to men. This discrepancy highlights the need to reassess what truly constitutes an ideal solution. Inspired by the engineering mindset, Georgina Terry embarked on designing bicycles using Dreyfus's data specifically tailored to women. Cyclists who have tried her bicycles attest that they experience less strain on their necks and shoulders compared to other models. This is attributed to the proportionately longer upper bodies and differing center of body mass of women. By shortening the distance from the seat to the handlebars and narrowing the handlebars, Terry created a more upright riding position suitable for women. Through this ingenious application of the engineering method, she has successfully sold millions of bicycles. For engineers, the pursuit of the best solution entails working within the given circumstances and continuously pushing the boundaries to discover more inclusive and improved alternatives. Chapter 3. Ingenious Problem Solving unconventional engineering in ancient trade. In the 17th century BCE, a senior official engaged in wine trade in the city-state of Karkemish, near the Turkey-Syria border, received a lucrative order for 18,000 bottles of wine from the neighboring king of Mari. The prospect of tripling his investment enticed him greatly. However, delivering the wine through the conventional means of a boat down the treacherous Euphrates River to Mari posed too many risks while a road caravan left them vulnerable to armed bandits. In desperate need of a solution, they turned to an ingenious idea, the Kelic. This 50-foot square raft, crafted from robust tree trunks and fortified with inflated goat skins, offered a viable alternative. Utilizing the remaining space on the raft, they loaded live donkeys, maximizing their resources. Upon arriving at Mari, the crew successfully delivered the wine and sold the raft's wood at a premium, as quality timber was scarce in Mari. They then carefully dried and packed the valuable goat skins on the donkeys, embarking on their return journey to Karkemish. This remarkable feat showcases the brilliance of engineering in the face of limited time, energy, materials, and uncontrollable circumstances. Inventors and creators consistently grapple with these constraints, requiring vision, adaptability, and comprehensive knowledge of their environment and situation to overcome challenges.
The materials available often dictate the choices made in creation. Wood, for instance, would naturally be employed when it is abundant. The design and structure of a car are intricately adapted to suit the specific type of fuel it utilizes, and as fuels continue to evolve, the forms and shapes of vehicles and machinery will inevitably undergo a gradual transformation. The role of engineers is to meticulously weigh all variables, predicting the best possible outcomes, while making necessary trade-offs and fine-tuning the process along the way. A prime example of such trade-offs can be found in the design of the soda can. While more cuboid-shaped cans can fit into a given space, their sharp edges compromise their structural integrity. In contrast, the cylindrical shape of a soda can provide strength while using less material. Ingeniously, engineers design the can's top to enable stacking like a cuboid, striking a balance between strength and functionality. No seeker of solutions ever enjoys perfect circumstances or abundant resources, yet there are always clever and inventive ways to surmount obstacles. The art of engineering lies in embracing these challenges and uncovering innovative approaches to problem solving. Chapter 4, Unleashing the Power, Charles Parsons and the Revolutionary Steam Turbine When Navy ships gathered for the Grand Review during Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee, they never expected the triumph that awaited Charles Parsons. Through daring connections, he secured a place in the lineup, and to everyone's astonishment, his ship emerged victorious, outperforming even the most formidable vessels of the era. But how did Parsons' steam turbine engine rise to become the standard? And why is it still the primary source of electricity generation in coal, gas, and nuclear plants today? Parsons's early years were steeped in the world of mechanics. Growing up amidst his father's collection of machines on their Irish estate, he observed glassblowers and blacksmiths honing their crafts. His father, William Parsons, an esteemed astronomer who once owned the world's largest telescope, the Leviathan, instilled in him a fascination with the wonders of the mechanical world. As one of the first engineers to graduate with a comprehensive understanding of mathematics and physics, Parsons applied his knowledge to devise solutions for his steam turbine. His ambition was to design a faster, more efficient engine that consumed less coal, required fewer materials, demanded minimal maintenance, and operated with reduced noise levels. Immersed in the problem, he developed a plausible hypothesis. By carefully adjusting the speed at which steam flowed through the turbine, he could extract more energy from the hot vapor. To explore this concept, Parsons delved into the wealth of research conducted by 19th-century scientists, who had already catalogued the properties of steam. He particularly drew inspiration from the works of William John McCorn Rankin, the founding father of thermodynamics and other eminent scientists in the field. By harnessing this knowledge, Parsons gained a clear understanding of what was feasible and what would be futile, allowing him to conduct targeted experiments that swiftly propelled him toward a solution, while avoiding wasted time on mere conjecture. The process spanned a decade, as Parsons meticulously refined his design through a series of trial and error. Eventually, he created a system that effectively slowed the steam's passage, optimizing energy extraction to unprecedented levels. In essence, Parsons harnessed science to establish reliable rules of thumb. Engineering, he understood, transcended mere applied science, it entailed a creative process that extended beyond mathematical prowess. While other scientists had access to the same information and data, they did not venture into the creative realm that inspired Parsons to envision the future. Science served as his enabling tool, akin to a hammer in the hands of a skilled carpenter, aiding him in reaching the finish line faster. Following his triumphant display at Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee, the British Navy swiftly adopted Parsons's steam turbine, solidifying its position as the global standard for power generation. Notably, his engine was among the systems employed to propel the ill-fated Titanic. This success raises a pressing question. If Charles Parsons built upon existing knowledge to establish new rules of thumb, who then should receive credit for the invention? Chapter 5 the Illuminating Rivalry, Collaboration and Advancement in the Age of Edison and Maxim One of the most legendary rivalries in the world of technology unfolded between Thomas Edison and Hiram Maxim. While history predominantly remembers Edison as the victor, the truth behind their competition is far from simplistic. 
Edison, fueled by the investments and resources of his backers, dedicated considerable time and effort to perfecting the electric light bulb. However, his early incandescent bulbs faltered, emitting mere minutes of light before the filament burned out. The crucial challenge they faced was finding a filament that could endure the intense heat. Meanwhile, Maxim made significant strides in the field of filament modernization. Collaborating with Louis Latimer, a talented African-American inventor, they successfully designed a bulb capable of lasting up to 40 hours. Maxim's success in improving the light bulb infuriated Edison, while Maxim himself resented the notion that he had stolen Edison's ideas. Yet, both innovators acknowledged the indispensable role played by the knowledge inherited from previous generations and the teams upon which they relied. The allure of the lone inventor's tale may captivate our imaginations, but it fails to do justice to the collective effort and collaborative endeavors that underpin transformative inventions. The truth is, there is no such thing as a solitary inventor. Chapter 6. The Hidden Journey of the Microwave, From War to Culinary Revolution The story of the microwave oven unveils a web of complexity and unexpected turns. During World War II, the British developed a revolutionary device known as the magnetron, a high-frequency shortwave emitter aimed at enhancing the detection of Nazi fighter planes. With its potential to alter the war's course, mass production became paramount. However, the British faced significant obstacles in both production capabilities and the procurement of essential raw materials due to the Nazi blockade. In a daring move, the British clandestinely transported their model across the Atlantic to America, where Percy Spencer, a brilliant scientist and engineer employed at Raytheon, a renowned radio and vacuum tube production company, took on the task of finding an affordable means to mass-produce the magnetron using more accessible materials. Spencer's ingenuity not only aided in defeating the Nazis but also laid the foundation for a culinary revolution. The magnetron, by transmitting short waves of high frequency, generated heat, an essential characteristic of what would become the microwave oven. While soldiers during the war discovered the microwave's potential for self-warming, the prevailing legend revolves around Spencer's accidental encounter. As the tale goes, the magnetron melted Spencer's chocolate bar, leading him to envision its application in food preparation. Post-war adaptations of the chunky microwave allowed restaurants to fully cook meals in mere minutes. However, the challenge remained in creating a compact, affordable version for home use. To achieve this, the selection of appropriate materials was crucial. Spencer and Raytheon, in their pursuit of affordability, made a trade-off, sacrificing cooking speed. Surprisingly, microwave users did not mind this compromise. The story of the microwave exemplifies the intricate nature of innovation. The humble microwave oven, initially never the intended goal, became an invention that revolutionized the culinary landscape, a creation that the world never realized it needed. Summary. Individuals who possess profound expertise in their respective domains possess the ability to challenge conventional limits by applying innovative approaches to existing problems. In order to confront these challenges, they can leverage accessible resources and navigate through ambiguity and mistakes, ultimately unearthing the most optimal outcomes. However, it is important to recognize that the best outcomes may not always be universally applicable. Engineers invariably carry their personal motivations and cultural influences with them, albeit unconsciously. Fortunately, a comprehensive understanding of the historical context and the contributions made by individuals from diverse backgrounds enables engineers to value the tools they utilize. Moving forward, you will undoubtedly develop a profound appreciation for engineering as both an art form and a discipline. It is a field capable of utilizing scientific evidence to establish new guidelines, and when those guidelines become obsolete, engineers push the boundaries even further for the betterment of humanity. Who knows, you may even employ the principles of engineering to discover shortcuts in your own personal journey. Now, thank you for taking the time to watch, and if you found value in this video, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel, and in case you want to buy the book, use the link in the description. Trust me, you won't regret it.